All right, everybody, welcome. We are here at the June 26th edition of the Free Market Healthcare webinar, Cash Patients and Cash Doctors, brought to you by your Freedom Hub. Tonight, we have a very exciting night in store because we've got Dr. Mary Ruard on here, and, and a lot of people know who she is, and for those that don't, you're in for a nice little treat. She's going to be covering a couple different topics and kind of as an offshoot of where we're going with this webinar series in general about the idea of how do we create and then navigate this free market that actually exists out there. We're just trying to help expand it. And so this is a chance for you to help see what's going on and, and see how you can jump in and participate as well. So this is for doctors and consumers and patients and just anybody that has to take care of their health and would like to get to a better solution than the one we've been saddled with. So, Mary, thank you so much for being here tonight. Oh, well, you're welcome, Jeff. It's actually a pleasure to be here. I always enjoy talking with other liberty-minded people. <laughs> Super. Well, we're going to dive into this with you here in a minute. I'm going to do a little quick little rundown on the program in general just to kind of set the context and set up our conversation. But before I jump into that, I was going to tap Charles to see if he can give us a little bit of a rundown on who's going to be happening these next coming weeks. Uh, indeed, Jeff, and welcome, Mary, and very excited to have Mary return to talk about her organization and how her international flavor of liberty and background in health is really going to make for a good webinar. But real quickly, Jeff, coming up over the next four weeks, we have coaching. Uh, we have uh, a big strategy as something we offer to families and the businesses, and part of that strategy is Avoiding health care with wellness and assessing your own self and coaching can be an important part of figuring out where you want to be in life and getting control of yourself. And Akiva Boker is a, a very wide-ranging coach with a lot of abilities for entrepreneurs and people trying to find their path. That will be an exciting uh, event next week. So in two weeks, there is a new Forbes-featured uh, medical savings account called an HMA that is really taking the market by storm for doubling your money for all of your out-of-pocket expenses. We'll have the owner of that company as our guest in two weeks. In three weeks, nurses increasingly are offering themselves for a lot of primary care type services. Abigail Norton will co-host that night for the opportunity that nurses have for the future of healthcare. And what kind of activism uh, she and her cohort are doing for health freedom in general, much like uh, Mary will discuss tonight with health freedom. And in four weeks, the, well, we always preview four weeks out, HSAs are underutilized health savings accounts for investments. And Pat Jarrett from Health Savings Administrators will co-host in four weeks for the potential of HSAs for investments not just building up money for out-of-pocket costs. So that is your preview, Jeff. All right, fantastic. That's a great lineup, as you can see. And every week the goal is to have something really unique and different and some great perspectives and let you be at the forefront of what's been happening. So before we kind of get underway, let me just dis create a little bit of a disclaimer here for a moment because I'm going to definitely show you a little bird's eye view of the whole program, but it's not going to get into a lot of the minutia of it. So just to let you know, this is not replacing a full presentation. You're going to want to still read all the documentation about the program to make sure it's a good fit for you, excuse me, fit for you and that you understand it and that you do follow up with the person that direct you to be here to learn all about every feature and they'll be able to guide you through what's going to be a perfect fit for you and if it is, in fact, even, even a fit for you. And as I said, every week we're going to have other experts on here from a variety of areas, associations, industry leaders, thought leaders, doctors, and consumers too, where we're going to all get to learn together the experiences and the realities of having a program like this and what it's like to navigate the free market. Now to set the thing up, kind of what we're doing here, you know, what's kind of in it for me is, is the problems that the consumer faces. And the doctors have some of these same problems and they got their own problems. And we're sort of helping on both sides. But from the consumer perspective, you know, the main issue is the fact that the cost is skyrocketing with no end in sight. And every year it's up over last year, which is just unbelievable. Before you know it, it'll consume all of your money and you'll have nothing left even to buy food, it would appear. There's nothing in it for the patient. 
it's just money draining out of their world financially and unless they get some severe thing where they get admitted to a hospital they're probably not going to see any money coming back their way so it's just a financial drain when they try to use it there's some networks now it may seemingly be or brag that it's kind of big but the idea of a network is a restriction in and of itself so that's not a good thing and the fact that people don't know where any of their medical records are it's like the most important thing like besides your credit report are your medical records where are they no one has a clue so this is a big problem and then all the time that's wasted driving places waiting waiting to get appointments all the rest of what all that entails so that's consuming a lot of your valuable usable time and that's one of your most precious resources and then the fact that things not personalized it's totally a one-size-fits-all mentality you know, here it is, take it like it is, here's the deductible, here's the monthly, have at it, and it's, there's nothing special to it or about it for you. So with our program, just as a quick overview, we've got a variety of options, including using a direct primary care physician, which is one we like to highlight and we might talk about a little bit tonight, realistically. And that's where you're gonna pay a monthly fee to have a doctor. So it's short for direct primary care physician. Some people have called them concierge doctors in the past, but it's becoming more popular and it definitely fosters what we're talking about here tonight. Also, the idea of having a concierge. So most people are pretty busy, and frankly, they don't know much about healthcare or the health industry, so they need a good helper. And so our system provides them with a number that they can call and readily talk to somebody to help them find a variety of things, which you'll see here as we continue on. We're gonna be real big on preventative because I'd rather not have the heart attack. So that's a big part of where we're coming from as opposed to just being there for when you do have some, something bad happen, which of course you need, but you know it's kind of focusing on the wrong end of the problem, so to speak. And then the idea of tapping into current technology. So the idea of being able to use a telemedicine situation where I can reach a doctor 24 hours a day via my phone or Skype or some other convenient methodology, which is super fast when it comes to saving time. And now I don't have to go to the emergency room or any of the other number of things I might have tried to do in the past, I, I can alleviate all of those hassles. And then very importantly that we're going to use the concept of medical cost sharing as opposed to insurance when it does come time for those big bills, meaning I'm at the hospital and so on. And as a consequence of having all this choice, that I can also engage in medical tourism, which means that I can travel to a different hospital. So the idea of getting outside that network. So maybe the hospital in the neighboring state is even better than what I have available to me here. Better quality, better price, the whole nine yards. So now I have the latitude to do all that because guess what? Now we're putting you as the patient and the consumer in the driver's seat. And at the same time, your doctor's in the driver's seat because now you get to have a direct relationship and not have to deal with a third party interfering in that reality. And then also we can engage in more off beaten path, which really is kind of coming full circle because ideally a lot of it shouldn't be off the beaten path, but as, as is, is with insurance, it's considered that. But here you'll be able to be able to participate in that. And then also the idea of managing the money, because if we're going to do two things, we're going to be a lot less money than you're typically spending, so we're freeing up dollars. And then independent of whether you have this or you had insurance or whatever, there's still money that you owe somehow, somewhere. And so the idea is you want to figure out how do I best manage those monies that I'm going to need to come up with. And that's what we were previewing. So we're going to have some people on both these topics, the HSA and the HMA, in the next couple of weeks on these things because it's that important. So let's take a quick scan at the whole program and then we'll start to jump into this with Mary real quick. So the idea of the insurance mentality is what you see at the bottom where it says contain because that's the big problem. That's where the containment comes in. Just like I have homeowners, I'm worried about the house burning down. I'm not worried about getting the lawn mowed. I can take care of that. But it's if that house burns down, I got trouble. So contain is for that large medical bill, and we'll come to that in a minute. But again, we want to do all these other things in advance of that. This is my strategy as opposed to having like a one and done or some simple product that I've bought. I need a whole strategy to get to my goal and the first thing I want to do is really be equipped to avoid all of these issues and we're kind of covering a couple things at once in this particular category because we're going to have a variety of assessment tools and ways that you can determine the caliber of your health right this minute and what you need to do to preserve it or improve it and then on top of that you're going to have all your medical records so as I indicated that we had that uh, special uh, card and phone number well this is a, a visual of it 
and you'll see two things. One, there's the 800 number that the um, that the consumer of our product, so whoever's the member, this is a private number that they're to call. And whenever they need any of those services, hey, I need to talk to a doctor this minute. I want to do medical tourism. I need to get a better price on a medication. All of that's available by them just calling this singular number. So it makes executing easy as the consumer, yet there's a lot of moving parts that make up that strategy. And then the other biggie is the fact that there's this QR code visible on the back. So this is scannable by first responders or emergency room staff, and that's got only the portion of your medical records that you need them to see, meaning who do I contact, who's my regular doctor, hey, don't ever give me this particular medication, I'm allergic to it, or any number of things that they need to know like that. And then in the rest of the vault that you have access to is the rest of the medical records that you're sharing for yourself with other doctors or with current doctors. So when I see a doctor, my notes from that doctor go right into my vault. So I always have all of my stuff, so I'm traveling or go to a new doctor or whatever, I'm already equipped with everything at my disposal, just a click away, and I'm in control of it. So again, that's kind of getting you off to a good foundation and a good starting place. Then we want to prevent. Well, this is done one of two ways. If you're using one of the programs that's Affordable Care Act compliant, then all of the 64 services that make that up that were part of the Affordable Care Act, you know, the colonoscopy and the mammogram and all the particular, you know, uh, preventative tests that they would potentially do are all built into this that way where there's no copay and no deductible. There's no charge for you to use that side of the service. If you have a direct primary care physician, then they will provide those services to you. That's a part of the way their model functions. So we, we fit to either format. Then, as I said, when you're managing it, that means that something's starting to happen. Oh, my throat's starting to get scratchy, or I'm, I'm beginning to feel like something's amiss. So I might call that concierge and say, hey, I think I need to talk to a doctor right now. And then the next thing you know, you're talking to a doctor 24 hours a day. Or the doctor then says you need to get this medication, and maybe you want to get a better price for it, so you're back on with that concierge. So you're helping manage your health with your helper as it were. And then, of course, the other part of managing it is what you're doing with any monies that you're moving back and forth. Then if it escalates a little further where we want to now start mitigating it, so here's where we are now calling that teledoc directly because now I really know I got something amiss and I'm debating whether I should rush to the emergency room right this minute or go away till Monday to see the doctor, you know, how severe is the issue so I can find that out and they'll help advise me what I need to do. The idea of second opinion is if something comes up and you suddenly need surgeries or something, and maybe you do and maybe you don't, so you're going to want to get a second opinion, and we're going to provide that for you too. And that's an excellent uh, ability for you to validate what it is because, you know, everybody's afraid of having surgery, so you don't want to rush into it just because some surgery center, which loves to do surgeries all the time, suggests you need it. The other thing is the idea of global meds. So that's back to that concierge. Suddenly I get this medication, and lo and behold, it's a – really kind of unique drug and it's expensive and you know I can't find any good price on it. I mean I, I used to be eight grand but now I find a place I could do it for six grand and lo and behold we might be able to do it for under a thousand because we're able to get medications across the planet. So there's some great features that, that really work for you specifically as opposed to being convenient for the company, for the insurance company, or whoever it might be. You know, this is what they decided they want to do. That's not necessarily the best thing for you. This is geared again around you. And as I said, the medical tourism. And then lastly, the containing. So this is the part everybody's always most panicked about and focused on. So let's de excuse me, dive into this just a little bit deeper here for a quick minute. So again, there's the card again. Now, the idea of the containing is the fact that it is for large catastrophic issues. I broke my leg. I had a heart attack. I'm in a car accident. I got cancer. So it's something big. It's not like I caught a cold. And the difference is that this is a, a group of community of people plugged together to share the cost of all of this. So this has been going on for decades. And the idea of it is it's medical cost sharing as opposed to insurance. So insurance, the risk is transferred to the insurance company. In this instance, the risk is each of us individually are in this group, and we've collectively decided to put money in here at the same time. So there's money in there for the medical bills. And again, this has been used for a very long time, and, and why this is growing so rapidly, because it's a more ethical approach to it, and here's kind of why. Instead of trying to hit some massive 
deductible, let's say you're a family, you got a $10,000 or $13,000 deductible, it's going to take a lot of stuff happening between all the different family members to get the $13,000. But in this situation, it's tied to a specific need. So if I broke my leg, that's one need. I have a heart attack, that's one need. And whatever I selected, and you can pick between $500 and all the way up to $5,000 with some stops along the way, how much you would pay for any individual need that would occur. So if I pick the 500 and I get a $10,000 bill for the broken leg, I'm paying 500. If I've got the 500 and it's a $100,000 bill for the heart attack, I'm paying 500. The most I would have going in any given year is three. So in this example, that would be $1,500 would be the most that you would be subjected to. And if a fourth thing occurred, the likelihood of having three happening it would be pretty amazing. But if a fourth thing happened, there wouldn't be any out-of-pocket expenditure with that because you've already satisfied the three. If it's a couple or a family, then it's a total of five with a max of three per individual. So if the wife had three things, anything else happened to her is no charge. But if the husband has something, he's got to have at least two before the third thing would be no charge. And then anybody else in the family or either of them beyond that, there would be no charge. So those are pretty hard to imagine having occur, but at least it's got a limiting factor by having it be out there like that. One of the other bigger differences, too, is that the money is sent to you as the consumer. So if it's that $100,000 bill, you're getting all the money, and then plus you add your 500, and then you pay the whole tab. So this way, the person who the hospital assumes is in charge is you. And again, that's the whole purpose of this. And then the other big difference, uh, two other big distinctions is one is with drugs. So if the person has a heart attack, it takes 18 months to recover. All of the paid is at 500. They're fully cured. They've got another 12 months if something relapses. They don't owe any other dollars because it's already part of that original event. And if the doctor says you're cured, go away. But I want you to take a pill from now on. We'll share in the cost of that pill for 120 days. And then after that, they're going to be managing the cost of that on their own with the help of the concierge and using the HSA or the HMA. So we'll you know, have a whole mechanism for that side of it. And then the other, other one is that in the first year, and it continues on a little bit, but again, for purposes of this being a short uh, de demonstration, in the first year, there's no sharing on any pre-existing conditions. So again, that's why I was uh, instructed that you need to get back to the person you spoke with to figure out if this totally fits your perfect situation. So I appreciate that indulgence, but now you'll get a little flavor as we kind of sift through this, where this kind of fits with what Mary's going to kind of chat about a little bit here yet tonight. So Mary, I've got you there. Are you there? I am. Can you okay. hear me? I can. I'm just trying to get over to where I wanted to go with you. Okay, okay. here it is. There we are. I wanted to get to your website. So, because you can do it better than I, why don't you describe for kind of a minute a little bit of your background, you know, for a couple of minutes and kind of the most recent stuff you've been engaged in, and then we'll kind of get into our discussion. Sure. Well, I'm a research scientist by profession. I have worked in academia. I was 19 years with the Upjohn Company in their... Uh, natural products and uh, and other types of drugs uh, division and worked on HIV proteases, uh, prostaglandins, which are now usually called eicosanoids. I have several patents on prostaglandins and liver disease, um, cytoprotective properties, etc. And I have also been in the liberty movement for, well, let's see, <laughs> I'm going to date myself here, but it, it's been pretty much um, well over 30, 35 years. And I am a libertarian. I have been very active in the Libertarian Party. So I've actually even run for the presidential nomination in 2008. Um, I'm best known for my books that uh, Jeff is showing you now, Healing Our World. Uh, it's now in its fourth edition. It takes the ideas of liberty kind of step by step and explains how they really are similar to what we do on a one-to-one -one basis when we interact with neighbors. And also my latest book, Death by Regulation, How We Were Robbed of a Golden Age of Health and How We Can Reclaim It details how the 1962 amendments to the Food and Drug Act have taken somewhere between five and ten years off each of our lives. I'll be showing you a couple graphs from that book as I describe the impact of regulations on our health care costs and how Health Excellence Plus uh, works around them to you know, really give us the best care. 
So that's my general background. I am also chair of Liberty International. I've been on the board of several Liberty uh, loving uh, foundations. Those of you who might have followed the libertarian movement or the liberty movement for a while might have known Liberty International as the International Society for Individual Liberties, Liberty, uh, but unfortunately our acronym was ISIL. So our website got hacked multiple times and destroyed and we finally decided we better change our name. So you, what you're seeing now on the screen is our home page, and we have had uh, something like 32 or 33 conferences now throughout the world. We have them annually. Our last one was in Mongolia um, just, uh, just uh, really uh, um, a few days ago. And our next one will be in Colombia in August. So if you are interested in possibly attending one of our conferences, which really are fantastic, not just from the speaker aspect, but the fact that we all kind of interact throughout the many days as a family. It really is a wonderful, wonderful experience. So I hope you'll consider joining us for our next conference in Columbia. We also go throughout the world and we think of ourselves kind of as a Johnny Appleseed uh, sowing seeds of liberty throughout the world and of course that's very helpful when we're talking about for example going out for prescription drugs throughout the world to get the best prices or doing medical tourism so as you can see we're very excited about the ideas of health excellence plus because it dovetails very well with our own mission so real, what real I, quick, what, real quick, Mary, before you kick in, just to close this out, how many different countries are a part of Liberty International? Oh, you, you know, we've got reps in like 85 countries or something. And usually in our conferences, we we often have 30 or 40 countries represented. So it's it's a global phenomenon. So a lot of these underlying currents of what we're doing here in the United States that we're trying to accomplish, other places and other countries are trying to get to the exact same destination. So it's kind of fellow travelers there. So it's really good. And oh, and yes, I see. Here's this list of all the ones you've been doing all the way starting out in Zurich. Yes, which, yes, which is yeah. interesting. It's it's true. What's nice about it? It's, instead of meeting in the same overseas couple of places every single time. You're taking it on the road. Every single event is somewhere different. That's right. That's right. And you know, one thing we've learned, I'd like to put, I always like to put out some optimistic comments, is that when Ron Paul ran for uh, the Republican presidential nomination in 2008 and 2012, he really activated a lot of liberty-loving students and young people throughout the world. It's not just happening here through Students for Liberty or Young Americans for Liberty. It's also happening all over the world. And this has not been the case. I, I've, you know, I'm getting to the point where I'm almost ready to pass the baton. And I've always wondered, will there be people to pass the baton to? <laughs> and now I don't worry anymore. But we did go for decades without really recruiting the youth. Uh, that has all changed. And one of Liberty International's missions is to engage the young people and any new liberty lovers and really educate them on what it means to have liberty. And of course, in a political sense, what it means is freedom from government interference or aggression. And you know, that's what the American Revolution was fought for, and that's what our country was founded on. And we seem to have forgotten that to a large extent, especially in the medical industry. <laughs> and I'll give some examples of that. Did you want to say anything else, Jeff? No, just the last thing is you kind of drifted into it. We'll close with this because this is the exciting thing, too, when you said pass the baton. It's one of the big things you do with these events is that you're sponsoring students to be at these as opposed to just the people that are older and have money and just love what you're all about. And it's just like a fun get together session and we pat each other on the back that actually you are stimulating and creating activists and things that actually start to occur in the wake of each of these events every year. So that's so, right. So that's so that's what's great. So yes, but that, that's enough on that. This was great, but I definitely want to point out kind of the breadth of what you're engaged in. And the truth of it is that all these things are interrelated. You know, it seems like you're doing different things, but in reality, they're all connected. And so that's what's been critical about what you are doing. So, but let's delve into what you wanted to kind of disclose to us today. And I know you wanted to start with this particular image here. 
Yes, yes. Well, let me let me first say uh, before we get into the graphs um, that one of the reasons healthcare costs and drug costs are so high in the U.S. is because we have more government interference or regulations uh, in that arena than most other countries. And the sad thing is that um, you know these extra regulations don't help us. I mean, if they gave us more safety, for example, in drugs, we would be maybe more excited about them, but they actually are detrimental uh, and not helpful. And I'm showing you, or actually Jeff is showing you uh, this graph, which really shows how the prices that we pay at the pharmacy for brand new drugs, not, you know, a different formulation or something, but brand new drugs is directly correlated to the research and development that a company has to engage in to get it on the market. So what you're seeing on the y-axis is the average cost of a branded prescription drug in 2017 dollars. And on the bottom x-axis of the graph, you're seeing the R&D uh, that um, a company pays a per what we call new chemical entities or NCEs in millions of dollars. And this graph actually only goes through uh, about 2012, I believe. So, you know, this is increasing all the time. And you can see that um, as the cost of getting a drug on the market increases, so too, uh, you know, do the pharmacy prices increase. And of course, if that's the correlation, if that's what we're seeing, then it's very important to keep the costs of getting a drug to market down. But as the next graph shows, it actually is increasing exponentially. It's huge. So if costs keep going up like this, it's going to be impossible to keep drug prices down. And these costs are not about drug discovery. They're mostly about the FDA regulations that companies must meet to get their drugs on the market, mostly the price of, and the cost of clinical studies or human trials. So as you can see, these regulations really are driving the cost of pharmaceuticals in the US. It's one of the reasons that our pharmaceutical prices are so high. It's, it's the single most important reason, uh, at least, uh, at least that I can see. This data has been out, out, really out there for a long time, but no one's put it together, and that's what I did in my book, Death by Regulation. And uh, again, remember that we aren't having any more safety with all these costs because the costs started really accelerating after the 1962 amendments to the Food and Drug Act. Before that time, about two and a half percent of all FDA approved drugs were eventually withdrawn from the market for safety reasons. After the amendments, it was 3.3 percent. So it actually went up instead of down. Although I'm not sure those differences are significantly different. So we haven't gotten any increase in safety for this. And, and a graph I don't have with me today, but uh, I will just tell you, those amendments increase the time it takes to get a drug from the lab bench to the marketplace from four to 14 years. And so when the AIDS epidemic hit, the AIDS patients knew they didn't want to die waiting. And they hired black market chemists to make the same drugs that we were working on in the industry. And by the time the FDA gave us permission to test those drugs in people, every AIDS patient in the country that wanted them had already had them and were resistant. So we had to wait until we got a new di new newly diagnosed patients to do our studies. And if you watched the award-winning movie, Dallas Buyers Club, you saw how the FDA went after people who were trying to bring drugs in from overseas, uh, trying to help patients uh, by getting optimal nutrition and trying new things that hadn't been been tried yet. So it, it was a very sad situation and it, it continues to date to some extent. Um, and of course, this is why drugs are so expensive, but it's also why healthcare costs are so expensive. The thing is with the drugs, it, it basically all comes from the FDA. They're nationally regulated. So it's easy to show these types of correlations. 
with medical practice, uh, you know, you have things like licensing laws, certificate of need, and a lot of other things. So it's not so easy to kind of give you the bottom line. But one thing I want to talk about today, which relates to Health Excellence Plus, is the idea of coding. Um, any doctor that accepts Medicare has to use the Medicare coding for each type of office visit and treatment uh, and diagnosis that he in, is involved in with his patients. And if, if it's not coded correctly, the doctor can actually go to jail. And this has happened in a couple cases, although it isn't, um, I wouldn't say it's rampant by any means. But because of that, doctors have to hire, uh, the, on average, it looks like about seven-eighths of a full-time person, in other words, almost another person, to do the coding for them. So when doctors don't accept insurance, uh, and of course, as you know, uh, the doctors that are mostly utilized with the Health Excellence Plus plan are cash pay doctors. <laughs> they don't have to use those codes. They don't have to hire that extra person. And so, of course, you are able to get a lot of savings from the fact that the doctors aren't bound by those regulations. Um, and you know, again, this this idea of safety, I just want to reinforce this idea that, that, you know, we have regulations in place to think it'll make us more safe. But if you look at the 50 states and you look at how much blindness that we have in each state, you find that the more rigorous licensing laws produce more blindness. And that's because when you have these very strict licensing requirements, for example, for an optometrist or an ophthalmologist, what happens is that the number of would-be practitioners who want to do this job goes down because, you know, a lot of them can't afford the time or money to get the license. And so when you have fewer practitioners, the prices go up. When the prices go up, many people who are on the edge of solvency or, you know, are, are impoverished or disadvantaged, they have a problem because they really can't afford the services anymore. And because of that, they sometimes do without. In the case of electricians, states that have the most rigorous licensing laws for electricians also have the most accidental electrocution for the same reason. The poor decide they will go without an electrical pair or they'll attempt repair or they'll attempt it themselves and of course they get into trouble that way. And I wanted to bring that point forward because we sort of assume <laughs> that if we make a law that we intend to be an improvement on safety, that does not necessarily mean that the law actually provides that safety. In fact, apparently most regulations don't provide that safety. So it's an important thing to recognize that in increasing the cost of something, we really limit the amount of quality service delivered. And, and that's kind of why there's so much, uh, you know, wonderful things about health, care, health Excellence Plus, and, and Jeff went through a lot of the list. I don't want to I don't want to, you know, just kind of rehash it, but I do want to say what's important for me in particular is the emphasis on prevention and the emphasis on um, allowing people to use alternative health care options because I found those to be very wonderful in my life. When I was doing research at Upjohn, our rats were so healthy that we couldn't make them sick enough to test our drugs on. So what we did, because this was back before genetic engineering, what we did is we took away some of their vitamins to make them sick. And for example, in my rats, by taking away their choline, I was able to get something that looked an awful lot like alcoholic cirrhosis. And that's how we made disease models. When, when you do this enough, you realize, hey, <laughs> we need our vitamins and we, we need optimal nutrition if we want to stay healthy. And so I'm very big into prevention. Um, and I really applaud the emphasis that Health Excellence Plus puts on that because obviously if you prevent disease, 
you can keep costs much lower than if you're always treating it. It just makes perfect sense. So um, the other thing um, that relates to all this regulation is because different countries have different regulations for drugs, it is possible to go shopping globally and get lower prices. Uh, now that's not the whole story uh, in international drug pricing, but it is a big one. There are countries that don't have as many regulations. It's easier to get the drug on the market early and thus you know, make up uh, quite a bit of the cost of development in that country pretty quickly. So that is a big factor. And that's why Health Excellence Plus can go shopping and get some good deals. Now, the other thing, of course, is the medical tourism. Once again, regulations are different overseas, and that doesn't necessarily mean that there's less safety, as we just talked about. So what we're, what, what's happening here with Health Excellence Plus is they're taking advantage of the, the differences that different countries have in regulations in some parts of their plan and helping you to basically get lower rates because of that. And I'm really excited about that because I think one of the, one of the things that will fall out of that is there will be an increasing recognition about how destructive some of these regulations can be. And when that happens, when we have less regulation, uh, of course appropriately, less regulation in the sense of excess regulation, uh, then we will find that we can lower prices of healthcare and drugs throughout the world and make them more available to everyone. So that's what I wanted to share with you today. And of course, I'm, I'm delighted to take any questions you have and or to elaborate on something I've said that maybe I wasn't too clear on. Well, Mary, I was going to say that was great. So thank you very much. I appreciate the way you were kind of correlating how this stuff fit into the things that we're doing. But, you know, the, the ideas were just a facilitator because, frankly, if we're looking to, you know, put insurance out of business, if that's kind of our ultimate goal, we're, we're not going to do it by government edict or any of those types of way. That's all almost like the violent approach to do it. We just need to create an alternative that's better. I mean, you didn't have to say, hey, cab companies, you're out of business. Uber just showed up and everybody said, oh, the heck with the cab, I'll call an Uber. And so they create a better consumer product, which is the whole purpose of the market, which is the underlying thing we were talking about earlier when we were talking Liberty International. And so this allows more doctors to enter the market where a lot of them are dissuaded to get involved because it's just not worth the hassle. And at the same time for you and me as consumers, you know, now I got more choices that keeps prices stable or going down as it would over time. And then also the fact that I have choices suddenly. And then, then guess what? There's competition too, because now I got to lower my price on the dock across the street, or I have to compete with this other MRI facility and a whole bunch of other things that makes it better and better for you. And then for what we're doing, helps us keep the cost of the thing, our program, our monthly cost low. Because you know, if we don't have all those increasing costs as the markets become more competitive, as opposed to looking at a grid like we've got up in here, and imagine that's your health insurance premium every year. I mean, when do you have to cry uncle? So this is all a huge patchwork of things that all fit together, for yes. sure. Oh, that's so true, yes. And, and, the, and the other thing, too, which was unique about your thing, maybe you want to elaborate for a quick minute, and then we'll open it up here for some questions, was the fact that, you know, being in, in that pharmaceutical industry and also having this liberty approach and, and mentality and, and finger in that pie, you could really have, like, you were in two camps at once, unlike most people, either just drank the corporate Kool-Aid or that's all that they seemed to know with blinders they went to work every day. What have you seen? Is it if things changing or, I mean, and with the current administration, has that started to like break a couple log jams or what's starting to happen with our future when it comes to things like that, that are seemingly out of our reach or power? Well, I think... I think step by step, things are changing. For example, many of you probably have heard about right to try. You know, that right to try law was actually an outgrowth of this thing that was going on with the AIDS patients back in the uh, 80s and early 90s. Because what, what happened is cancer patients saw what the AIDS patients did. And they said, you know, we don't want to have to go to the black market to get our drugs. So we're going to sue the FDA 
in order to have access to drugs that are not yet approved by the FDA if we're terminal. But the courts ruled that Americans do not have the right to save their lives with drugs that are not yet FDA approved. And so the right to try movement basically was going after the same thing the cancer patients wanted, but they did it state by state. By the time Trump told Congress that he wanted the right to try bill at the national level on his desk to sign, 40 states had already adopted some version of it. And so what's happening is the liberty movement is starting to because this the right to try was promoted by the Goldwater Institute, which is part of the liberty movement. And they really, really were able to do it because people are so hungry for having new drugs and new treatments when they are terminally ill. In fact, there was a survey done recently that I saw and patients were asked if you could, if you could take a drug that you knew had been FDA approved and would give you four years of life, but no more, or a riskier drug that had not yet been approved, but would give you somewhere between five and 15 years of it worked and, you know, two or three years if it really didn't, what would you pick? And something like 60% of the people said they'd pick the riskier drug. So, you know, people want the opportunity to actually live a lot longer. They don't necessarily want something that'll help them live a little longer. And so, you know, they're willing to take that gamble. And, and it really is a valuable service to the rest of us because a lot is learned when these patients take drugs and they take it in an open way instead of on the black market because then we can look at the data and you know see what's happening earlier on. Very good. All right, well, we're gonna open up for some questions. I know we've got some medical professionals on here too today, so they might have an interesting perspective. Let's start out, Bertan, I see you've got your hand up there. Yes, hi, um, uh, Mary, thank you. This I have a sort of broad question for you. I'm in California and there's this, as I'm sure you know, there's this huge push now to mandate vaccines and um, it's it's really becoming this, this state characterized by sort of mer medical tyranny, but also kind of a criminalization of medicine with, I don't know if you've seen the latest amendments to SB 276, but it essentially um, makes the, any doctor who writes a medical exemption for vaccines um, faces perjury charges if if those um, if what if what they say the state doesn't agree with so I'm just wondering as we as we sort of see more um, medical tyranny and more sort of tyrannizing of, of doctors what political solutions or, or what sort of creative solutions do you see for that well I mean really with the vaccine issue the, the real challenge for those of us who believe in liberty is that if if people can, or the government can force us to have something injected in our body for any reason, even if it's for the health of the rest of the people, <laughs> then eventually that takes us down the slippery slope to having them inject whatever they want. And that is really scary to me. Um, I. I'm not an anti-vaccination person, but I respect the wishes of those who are concerned that the vaccine might hurt children. Because frankly, um, from a researcher's perspective, giving 36 vaccines or something like that in the first five years of life, to me, seems like you're really asking for trouble. It's, it's just overwhelming the immune system. I'm not sure an adult could take it. So, you know, I, I cannot see how this is uh, being promoted, except that, except that you can see the politics of vaccines are different than the politics of drugs. What was happening about 20 years ago, uh, maybe it's 25, my, my time sense isn't always good, um, was that the FDA started coming down pretty hard on vaccine manufacturers. And, you know, they would, and it, they would, um, uh, look at their manufacturing plant and demand that they upgrade it. 
And of course, you know, vaccines 25 years ago were meant to be given, you know, pretty, um, pretty infrequently compared to how they are done now. And so the vaccine manufacturer says, well, this doesn't make any sense because here we have something that is basically a once or twice use. Um, there's, you know, a huge liability for biological products because biological products tend to have more side effects than, say, a chemical, although not always, but, you know, but there's always the risk, for example, of, of a reaction, an allergic reaction. And so it got to the point where there weren't many vaccine manufacturers around. And that's why the government assumed the liability for vaccine injuries. So we pay on our taxes for vaccine injuries now. And once that happened, you know, the, the whole vaccine industry blossomed because now a big problem with vaccines had been taken away from them. They're not paying for it. The taxpayers are. And that's when we started getting these schedules where our children are getting huge amounts of vaccine in a small period of time, even drugs that are, I mean, even vaccines that are supposed to prevent, um, you know, sexual diseases, you know, are being given to prepubescent children. <laughs> and it's, it's uh, it, it, like I said, as a researcher, it really scares me uh, that that's being done. So I think we really need to fight strongly not to have the government dictate what can be injected into us because once they can inject us for one thing, they can inject us for another and we will have, you know, very little control over our bodies. And it, if they feel that you're a dissident of some kind, you're a troublemaker, eventually they will be putting you in the loony bin or they'll be injecting you with drugs that, you know, are are basically going to make you into a zombie. And and I'm not trying to be overly dramatic here. Uh, you can see what's happened with healthcare, the step-by-step -step encroachment, and you can pretty well extrapolate that that's, that's going to be a problem. And I, I wonder sometimes if that isn't why there's been such a, um, um, how do I say it, such a, a violent reaction on, on the part of of people who believe in vaccines, because I, I think there may be some encouragement from uh, the people in government who are into control. Not everybody is. I, I don't want to slander any politicians that you know are certainly liberty-minded and understand the risks of this. But I, I sometimes wonder if this isn't intentional. I don't know that for sure. But um, it just the whole vaccine thing has been very convoluted. Well, it's always a little scary when you're trying to rush into something without like slowing down and assessing it carefully before you get in the middle of it, because then you're stuck with it, maybe. Uh, Dr. Tinsley, I see you have your hand up there for a bit. Yeah, I just want to make a quick comment about the free market uh, that you, I think you were talking about earlier. Uh, I was uh, negotiating with some uh, a, a lab today, or uh, yesterday, Quest. I'm using True Health, and of course, Quest approached me and asked me why am I using true health and I told him I said well they beat your prices and uh, they said well how can we get you to come to Quest I said drop your prices well they're sending me a list of dropped prices so the free market you know competition more people in the market works just like you mm -hmm. said Dr. Ruar so um, I wasn't able to get the radiology people to budge at all uh, I'm not sure what's going on there but the, the labs certainly are dealing Yes. Um, They're the first to start to feel that pressure, you know, because it'll come to those other people for sure. Yeah, and, and of course, I, I, I had to hammer home the quest about uh, President Trump uh, signing the executive order with HSA is going to be uh, within the next you know, three to six months being allowed to use for direct primary care, and that he's probably going to see more of us out in the community. So that made him a little bit more eager to deal, I think. Yeah, that, you're probably right. Competition really is the way to keep costs down. And of course, the more regulations you have, the less competition you have. So <laughs> it's another reason prices go up. And plus, we've got a shortage of doctors to begin with. So anything stifling new people entering the market to help all of us is we're shooting ourselves in the left foot. Uh, Dr. Hunt, I see you've got your hand up there. Hi, very interesting. Thank you for all the presentation. It's great. Um, and I'm going to agree with you about vaccinations in that I'm a big vaccine fan, a pediatrician, love vaccines, most of them. 
Um, but absolutely intolerant of the notion of forcing them on anybody because that's an ethical issue. Yes. Uh, so uh, my question was going to be about uh, pharmaceuticals and the balance of, yeah, certainly I'm opposed to FDA from top to bottom, but um, the large pharmaceutical companies have this uh, amazing little deal with FDA that helps to exclude all the small players because FDA pretty much works hand in hand with the large pharmaceutical companies to keep monopolies intact. And yes. there's wonderful tales of that. Um, and what but about the flip side, though, is the kind of increasing amount of what in the olden days would be called snake oil, where there's no real safety studies, no real scientific clinical evidence that something's working, but a great deal of confidence that such and such a, a concoction works and supports the immune system or supports this or supports that. Um, how... Do we have any responsibility to help uh, push along the science um, totally outside of regulations and all that crap? Just say, look, we as payers, we as doctors, we as whoever are going to insist before you profit from something that there's some theoretical reason why it might work, some data that shows that it should work or actually does work before we promote it. Well, that's a really great question, and um, I have a couple of different things I'd like to share with you on that. The first is that snake oil uh, actually is quite beneficial. Um, there were some studies done comparing snake oil, rattlesnake oil, which is probably what it was in the U.S. when it was marketed, with fish oil, and rodents were given uh, at, uh, both uh, one of one of the two oils in their diet, and then they compared how long I think it was that the rats could swim, you know, their fatigue factor. And it turns out that even though fish oil was very beneficial, that the rattlesnake oil was even more so. So um, I always have a chuckle when somebody talks about snake oil salesmen because probably if somebody wasn't taking their cod liver oil at all back in those days, the snake oil was probably beneficial. And even if they were taking their cod liver oil, it might have given them an extra oomph. So um, the other part is, you know, how do we know that drugs are safe and efficacious? Uh, you know, if especially for lay people, how can they know? Well, certification is a really good way to get that information. And of course, as you probably know, there really isn't any third party testing right now with new drugs. The drug companies are told by the FDA which studies they must do, and they do the studies and they report on the results to the FDA. Now, having been in the industry, I don't think it's all that easy to fudge the data because too many people know about it because too many people are involved in producing it. But nevertheless, as you can, as, as you might might expect, there at least is an implied conflict of interest there. If you had third-party certification, which was actually starting up and, and really starting to get going prior to the 1962 amendments, you would not have as much doubt about a result if it's coming from a third party. And so that's, that's probably a better way to go. In fact, it's really amazing to me that consumer organizations have actually done a pretty good job of telling which drugs were bad and which drugs were good before the FDA either approved them or disapproved them. For example, the Abigail Alliance was uh, established after a young lady was denied for many months a treatment that probably would have helped her. It was actually tailored just for her type of cancer. And when she finally was allowed to take it, you know, she was, you know, almost on death's door. So it wasn't able to help her at that point. Uh, and, and so her father started this organization. And what this organization does, it looks at all the cancer drugs that are in clinical testing. And it seems to be able to tell uh, two or three years before FDA approval which drugs should be approved. It's, it's actually... Um, written letters to the FDA begging them to approve these drugs. There's 40 of them that they they specified that should be approved, and the FDA did eventually approve all 40 of them. So if a consumer organization can tell two or three years before FDA approval which drugs are working, uh, surely 
if we had a certifier that had scientists and doctors involved, uh, they, <laughs> they could probably do a much better job. You know, we really, uh, we really are practicing overkill in, in a lot of our uh, drug trials today because the FDA wants to be certain that if Congress calls them on the carpet for a drug that has side effects, and let's face it, all drugs have side effects, then they will be able to say, hey, we, we had 14 years of testing here. We asked for everything we could think of. So it's not our fault that the drug turns out, you know, not to be, not to be safe. So that's, like, uh, I, hope, I hope I've answered. Hmm? Yeah, I think UL listing works for so many other products. Yes. Why would exactly. it not work for pharmaceuticals and medical devices? Well, that's right. Like I said, even a consumer's organization can tell. And there's another consumer's organization, um, Citizens. Um, oh, it, it's uh, the name is. Um, uh, um, I'm, it's not coming to me right now, but it's a citizens group that uh, ha puts out a publication called Best Drugs, Worst Drugs, and they have predicted 50% of the drugs that were eventually taken off the market. <clears throat> and I think if we looked at which ones got black box warnings, uh, their list would probably be all there. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they just were comparing the ones that actually got taken off the market. Very good. Well, I appreciate you being here tonight. I'd like to get some more. I see we've got a couple other hands here, and we've pretty much run out of time here. So, Mary, I want to thank you so much for being on here. Um, one of the things that you've been doing, we'll just kind of show here as we close out a little bit, is that we've actually got some stuff set up for her. That this is going to actually have a, a video added to it. And this is giving her a chance to kind of promote to the people that she encounters in this healthcare strategy. So, this gives them a nice little tie in and allows you to contact them and support her organization. So this has been a, a great new thing that she's doing too. Do we want to kind of help further her cause and collectively we're trying to further the cause of freeing up these doctors. So I appreciate you being here again today, Mary, for sure. Well, well, I'm happy to do it. And for those of you who didn't get your questions answered, please email me. My email's mary at ruart.com, like my name, R-U-W-A-R-T.com. Or you can go to my website, ruart.com. Um, and that way you can, actually at my website, you can email me from my website, and that's maybe even better because I get a special flag when you email me from my webpage, and I get so much spam, as I imagine most of you do. Uh, I don't want to miss your, um, I don't want to miss your message, so if I don't reply in 48 hours, please try again, because I do answer all my emails. Excellent. And then, Charles, just to close us out, why don't you give us a quick recap of who's coming up over the next several weeks? I will do, Jeff. And Mary, fantastic uh, presentation as always. I think the, the, the advocacy that you discussed tonight does tie into health. And Akita Boker next week will talk about getting on your path while you're here through coaching and that ties to your health, and so much of everything ties to your health. That's why we like to push the envelope on these weekly Wednesday webinars with our interesting interesting guests. And then in two weeks, <clears throat> we'll be introducing a new savings account for healthcare, the HMA with Elliot Gorog, and then what nurses, not just doctors, can do in this new cash pay arena with Abigail Norton. And, and finally, a month from now, how we are underutilizing HSAs, health savings accounts, They're, they can be invested. And Pat and Jarrett from Health Savings Administrators will be our co-host that week. So come back next week. Thanks, Mary, and thanks, Jeff. Fantastic, Charles. And one of the things I like that he's trying to promote on those HSAs is that as opposed to a typical savings account, or, I'm sorry, a retirement account where you're forced to make distributions when you hit certain ages, the HSA doesn't. So it's really fantastic what he's going to start to tell us all about it. So another great uh, episode to stay tuned for. This is recorded. We're going to release it this coming Monday when we give you a little advanced tweak peek at who's coming up. So we'll always have a link and a couple of old ones to revisit. And you'll get to see this one from Mary this coming Monday. So again, thanks for coming, and I will see everybody next week.